Yes. Uh, so this afternoon, <clears throat> uh, sir, I am going to be uh, presenting a chronology relating to variants uh, CJD. Uh, this is uh, in written form. It's a written form of chronology, which will be published on the web website uh, uh, shortly after um, this talk um, uh, ha has concluded. Um, I should give the, um, a, a health warning about this chronology. It's uh, not intended to be a full chronology of all events um, pertaining to VCJD. And uh, in fact, as a result of uh, evidence that's come out in the last few days and, uh, and the end of last week, um, I fully intend to um, update the chronology uh, as we learn more about the key facts and events uh, relating to VCJD. So it's very much a work in progress, but it's uh, there to guide and assist people's understanding in, um, in the events and, uh, and how they unfolded. Um, so uh, the chronology um, begins with some uh, events that took place before VCJD was discovered. Um, I'm not going to um, uh, dwell on those in any detail, but we see, for example, uh, that, that, that CJD was dis described in the 1920s uh, by a German neurologist. Uh, and then we see a number of um, academic papers being written um, uh, with, with research being done into prion disease. Uh, and it gets its name, uh, the, C, uh, the C and J bit, Kreutzfeld Jakob, from the two researchers who, who first discovered it. Yes, and it? I... Yes. That was in 1920? Yes. Well, well uh, yes. I, I've got 1920s. I'm not sure I managed to... to um, oh, 20s, right. Uh, to to, to um, refine the date any more than that. Um, and then in, in the 1960s, we, we see a number of, of papers being um, written about, about uh, research into, into other prion diseases. So we heard from Professor Ironside about scrapie in sheep uh, and kuru, and so on. Um, we also have, uh, before the discovery of uh, VCJD in, in the 1990s, we have um, the uh, um, surveillance studies that Professor Ironside told us about. So between 1980 and 1984, there is a case control study of potential risk factors for um, CJD in England and Wales. And there's also a retrospective study of CJD in England and Wales between 1970 and 1979, which is published in 1985. Um, I'm then going to um, skip forward to uh, the 1st of May 1995, because on that day, an 18-year-old uh, died of what was thought at the time to be uh, sporadic CJD, but was subsequently uh, diagnosed as VCJD. And so that is, as far as we know, the, de the, the, the date of the first death uh, of somebody suffering from VCJD. But it was before VCJD had been discovered and described. Um, we then come to uh, really some very critical dates I I in the chronology, um, and we've heard some evidence about this from Professor Ironside. On the 8th of March 1996, hi 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 Professor Ironside and his colleague Professor Will presented their work on, N uh, on uh, what was then called new variant CJD, which is the same as CJD, to, to SIAC. Uh, and, and we see... Um, then, a, a, uh, 12 days later, on the 20th of March 1996, the then Secretary of State, Stephen Dorrell, making an announcement in the House of Commons that there was a probable link between BSE in cows and VCJD in humans on the advice of SIAC, SIAC having uh, uh, had uh, the work of Professor Will and Professor Ironside presented to it. Uh, and then on the 6th of April 1996, Professors Will and Ironside published their paper, which sets out their discovery, 
Uh, and if we could turn to that, please. It's HSOC 001-0099. Uh, it's a publication in The Lancet on April the 6th, 1996. And if we go down to the uh, bottom of the right-hand column for results, we can see uh, of the 207 cases of CJD examined neuropathologically since May uh, 1990, which uh, you will recall sir, was the day was was when the um, Research and Surveillance Unit uh, NCJD Research and Surveillance Unit uh, started th their surveillance. Um, Ten have neuropathological findings that clearly disting distinguish them from other cases examined by the CJD surveillance unit, uh, and it makes the point two have been reported previously. Um, and then if we go uh, over the page, please, to page four, we can see the conclusions at the bottom there. We believe that our observation of a previously unrecognised variant of CJD occurring to date only in persons under the age of 45 years is a cause for great concern. That it is due to exposure to the BSE agent is perhaps the most plausible interpretation of our findings. However, we emphasise that we do not have direct evidence of such a link and other explanations are possible. That these cases have been observed now because of improved ascertainment cannot be completely dismissed. It seems unlikely, however, that such a distinctive neuropathological pattern would have been missed previously, especially amongst persons dying at a young age. Uh, and then, um, sir, so we have heard in evidence from various witnesses about the meeting that was uh, convened on the 9th of April in 1996 um, in Edinburgh. Um, if we can just turn that up, um, NHBT 0115407. So this is a meeting convened three days after the publication of the discovery of VCJD. And we can see that that's been uh, organized by uh, Dr. Angela Robinson and been attended by a number of the um, individuals who have come and given evidence either orally or in writing to this inquiry. Um, and we can see that the initial part of the meeting compromised a pr presentation by Dr. Ironside on the 10 reported cases of variant CJD and an outline of our current understanding of prion disease. And indeed, Professor Ironside gave us um, some oral evidence in relation to that. Uh, and then we see at the bottom of that first page uh, what was agreed by the group. The UK Transfusion Service uh, should take urgent action to ensure that current European directors in this area are followed, in particular that direct questioning of donors in relation to a family history of CJD disease should now be instituted. And uh, we will pick up, uh, uh, pick up those references in the chronology. And if we go over the page, uh, they come to the view that it's inappropriate to consider extending current donor selection guidelines beyond the regulatory requirements until the position becomes clearer and agreed that action should be taken to improve current knowledge in relation to potential for CJD to be transmitted by blood transfusion and that knowledge would need to be acquired in relation to both classical and variant forms of the disease. Uh, and then paragraph four... Uh, essential uh, that accurate information is obtained to identify whether identified CJD patients have ever donated blood and that this would require information to be provided to transfusion services to enable interrogation of donor databases. And we've had evidence from a number of witnesses in relation to that. That is what turns into the TMER. Um, and then if we go down the page, we can see at five... It was agreed that there's a need to consider what action should be taken when a new case of CG, CJD is identified in a current or lapsed donor, and that the feasibility of introducing a form of look-back being instituted to assist in identifying the transmissibility of this agent by blood needs to be uh, assessed. And then at paragraph six, 
it was agreed that there is a requirement to investigate systematically whether reported cases of CJD have, re have received transfusions of blood or blood products. This may uh, require the initiation of carefully structured case control studies. Um, and then um, uh, if we go over the page uh, to uh, paragraphs uh, 7, 8 and 9, we can see um, that the, the position at seven of fractionators uh, was, w w was looked at following notification by blood centres of donors who have been rejected on the basis of CJD-related exclusions. Uh, and then um, in paragraph eight, agreed to consider the feasibility of introducing measures to re re reduce the impact of donor notification to plasma fractionators. Uh, in, in particular, implications of quarantining of source plasma or changes in the management of plasma from different pool sources. Um, and then paragraph nine, um, consideration about the possibility and potential benefits of reconsidering quarantining of frozen blood components was considered. So a whole range of actions considered by the blood services and the fractionators at a fairly a, a early stage after the publication of the discovery of VCJD. Um, the next uh, uh, event I want to uh, draw your attention to, uh, sir, takes place on the 1st of July, 1996. Could we have, please, BART uh, 40554? Uh, and this is a dear doctor letter from the then Chief Medical Officer Sir Kenneth Kalman in relation to um, new variant CJD. And it's delayed, uh, sorry, dated um, 1st of July, um, and it's to give information to clinicians about CJD. And if we go over the page to the uh, page two, uh, we can see that this is called PLCMO 96.5. Um, and uh, it's often referred to as guidance um, in, in subsequent documentation. Um, and uh, we can see that it provides general information about CJD. Um, and if we go over the uh, page, please, to page uh, three, halfway down that big paragraph there, it sets out SIAC's view, SIAC's opinion, was that in the absence of any credible alternative, the most likely explanation at present is that the cases are linked to exposure to BSE before the specified bovine offal ban was introduced in 1989. And then at the bottom of that page, there is a, a section on the transmissibility of uh, CJD. And if we go over the page uh, to the fourth page of this document, Uh, we can see that it says it appears that the important factors in transmission of iatrogenic CJD are the source of the extraneous tissue. Brain-derived tissue appear to, be present, uh, uh, to appear to present the highest risks and the route of administration. And then importantly for our purposes, there is no epidemiological evidence that blood, blood products or whole organ transplants pose a risk of transmission. However, as a precautionary measure, Exclusion criteria for blood and organ donors are in place, and these are kept under regular review. Uh, and then uh, the point that it's not vertically transmitted from mother to child in pregnancy through um, breast milk. Uh, and then um, evidence from iatrogenic disease and from Kuru suggests that the incubation period may be very variable, the average being between 5 and 15 years, um, and CJD does not behave like a conventional infectious disease and there is no risk of spread within families. So that's the uh, messaging that was going out to the clinical community about CJD in July 1996. Now, it, on the 1st of August 1996, the blood transfusion services in the UK began asking blood donors whether they had a family history of CJD um, and where a close family member had CJD, the donor would be advised not to give blood. Um, 
uh, and that uh, change in practice we see reflected in the declaration by donors uh, made um, together with questions about uh, whether the donor had had brain surgery, spinal surgery, or injection of human pituitary extracts. Um, and um, for those that want to look at, at, at that um, new declaration, it, it's at JPAC 604 underscore 134. The next event um, that I want to draw attention to is that on the 6th of January 1997, ethical approval was received by, uh, from the Midlothian Research Ethics Committee for the TMER, or to give it its pro proper title, a retrospective study to examine a possible link between CJD and blood transfusion. And so you may recall from the evidence that we've heard that that ethical um, uh, approval was on the basis that anyone uh, who was traced as a result of the TMR would not be told of their exposure. Uh, we then have on the 11th of January an important paper um, from uh, co-authored by Colin, Professor Collinge and Professor Ironside, amongst others, DHSC 304747 underscore 040. Um, and this uh, is a, uh, a paper in which they set out their findings about diagnosis of, uh, of CJD by tonsil biopsy, uh, and they say this, the diagnosis of CJD can only be confirmed by brain biopsy or at, ne or at ne necropsy. Although a rapidly progressive dementia, uh, myoclonus, other neurological signs, and a characteristic electro, electron, I can't remember, thank you, um, allows a confident anti-mortem diagnosis in typical cases, albeit at a relatively advanced clinical stage. Um, and then uh, they go down, if we go down the page to the second uh, paragraph there that starts recently, and a couple of sentences down. However, since PRP is widely expressed outside the central nervous system, we investigated whether an alternative and more accessible tissue might be biopsied, to allow a diagnosis of NVCJD before death and to avoid brain biopsy. PRP is expressed in the lymphoreticular system and prion replication is known to occur in the spleen and other lymphoreticular tissues in experimental rodent scrapie models. Prion infectivity has also been reported in human lymphoreticular studies. Uh, and then they say, we have studied PRP in tonsillar tissues obtained at necropsy using both immunohistochemistry um, on peridatal uh, da sign, I don't think I've, um, para para paraformaldehyde, paraformaldehyde, and formulin fixed tissue, and Western blot analysis of frozen tissue. The patient was a 35-year-old woman who died after a 14-month illness with de um, depression at onset, followed by ataxia, hyperreflexia, me memory loss, and dementia. A diagnosis of NVCJD was made by neuropathology. Abnormal PRP staining was present within tonsillar germinal centers. Um, and Western blot analysis revealed the presence of protein PRP, confirming the diagnosis of pro, uh, prion disease. Um, so that, that, that is, um, uh, as I understand it, the first suggestion of um, diagnosis as a result of um, uh, tissue from the lymphoreticular system. Um, on the 1st of July 1997, the Department of Health published the SIAC statement uh, entitled Research into Link Between New Variants CJD and BSE in answer to a parliamentary question. Uh, and that statement from SIAC con concluded that evidence had accumulated that was consistent with the hypothesis that a VCJD was caused by 
exposure to the BSE agent. So that link between the, the causal link between those two prion diseases, um, the evidence is, is, is mounting. And um, on the 23rd of September 1997, um, we have a letter from BPL to the English and Welsh Blood Services, which is uh, worth looking at. That's NHBT 305418 underscore 006. Uh, we can see, if we look at the second page, which we don't, we don't need to now, but, it, it, well, perhaps it, it's helpful to look at it now. The second page, we can see this is a letter from Terry Snape, and we can see the distribution list, list is to QA managers for English and blood centres and Welsh blood services, national medical directors, zonal clinical directors, and zonal operations directors. And then if we go back to the first page, we can see um, it's a dear... Um, uh, blank letter, uh, CJD, actions necessary in respect of post-donation advice of a donor determined retrospectively to have been in an at-risk category for CJD at the time of donation. And the purpose of the letter is said to be to confirm a requirement for advice to BPL of information which becomes available to centres in respect of donors whose plasma has been sent to BPL and which indicates that the donor may have been in a risk category for CJD at the time of the donation. Um, so, um, what, what, what the, in the second paragraph, um, the um, uh, B, BPL sets out its understanding of, of when a donor would, concern, would be considered to have been at risk for Z, CJD at the time of donation, uh, and that's if they had been treated with extracts derived from human pituitary glands, had a family history of CJD, or is identified as suffering from, or as having died after suffering from CJD, irrespective of the nature of the CJD disease. And in the last paragraph on that um, uh, page, uh, BPL um, say that in respect of donors, if we could go down to the last paragraph there, in respect of donors identified as having suffer, suffered from new variant CJD, um, BPL understand that that information won't immediately be available uh, to the um, uh, blood services, but arrangements have been made for such donors to be identified through the liaison between national blood services and the CJD surveillance units, uh, and uh, BPL has written to Dr. Hewitt as, uh, with her TMER hat on, uh, asking that the centre be advised of the identity of individuals who were donors who have died after suffering from new variant CJD. Um, and uh, BPL are asking for a review to be undertaken of plasma previously supplied to BPL from such donors and for a BPL to be advised accordingly. Um, on the 29th of September, 1997, the Chief Medical Officer issued a letter to the Directors of Public Health uh, regarding the publication of the research into the link between BSC and VCJD, and that letter concludes by stating that SIAC had concluded at its last meeting that the necessary measures were in place to protect publish, public health. Uh, and, uh, and then a, 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 another, a, 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 the CMO issued a statement on the 6th of October 1997 on CJD, publishing the latest figures from the uh, Research and Surveillance Unit in Edinburgh, uh, and stating that one of the VCJD patients identified was suspected of being a blood donor, while the other three had been confirmed, while well, another three had been confirmed as blood donors. Um, 
Now I'm going to turn to some uh, papers, uh, some documents that deal with uh, the uh, recall of products starting in, in 1997. So the per first is DHSC 0041442 underscore 050. Um, so um, this is a document dated the 23rd of October 1997. It's from the Medicines Control Agency, and it records a CMPM, uh, if we can go down, decision on the action to be taken to minimise the risk of transfusion of NVCJD uh, via plasma-derived um, me medicinal uh, products. Um, and it sets out um, uh, uh, I'm sorry, I've just um, that there should be a recall of batch batches of blood products if a blood donation to a plasma pool was subsequently found to have been made from a person who developed VCJD. So we see that in uh, paragraph one. Um, uh, and we can see that the working party deferred making a recommendation on the possible recall when plasma-derived products are used as excipients in vaccines, cytokines and other medicinal products. Um, the next event is um, on the 24th and 31st of October 1997, and we don't need to go to this document, but it, it's, it, it, this information comes from a, from a report uh, authored by Dr. She Shepherd and Dr. Snape called VCJD Blood Components and Plasma Products, and they, no they note in that report that BPL were notified on three separate occasions um, on the uh, 21st uh, and 31st of October and on one other occasion, that they had received seven donations of plasma donated by three donors who had been confirmed as having died from VCJD uh, and six of the seven donations had been included in fractionation pools and it's noted that recipients of, those plas of that plasma had not been notified. Uh, and we know um, from uh, other documentation uh, that BPL on the 30th of October recalled factor eight and albumin from a pool to which VCJD diagnosed donors had contributed. Um, and then if we turn, please, to DHSC 0042286068. We, so DHSC 0042286068 underscore zero six eight. And this is also a document dated the 30th of October. It's from the National Blood Authority. Um, it's uh, a recall notice on plasma products. It's a media statement. Following instructions received from the Medicines Control Agency based on a new recommendation by the Committee on Proprietary Medicinal Products, CPMP, the National Blood Authority has today initiated a recall of plasma products, albumin and factor eight, from 26 distribution sites in England. CPMP has recommended that there should be a recall of batches of blood products if a blood donation to a plasma pool was found to have been made from a person who developed NVCJD. It has now been established that plasma from a donor who subsequently developed NVCJD contributed to this batch of blood products. This recall is purely a precautionary measure since there is no epidemiological evidence to suggest that CJD can be tr transmitted between humans through blood transfusions 
or the use of blood products. So that was on the 30th of October. Uh, and now I'm going back in time because I want to pick up on an important event that happened on the 24th of October. But I wanted to go to this because it was part of that uh, recall um, it, uh, initiated on the 23rd of October. So if we could go please to NCRU uh, 40174 underscore 001. Uh, we can see a uh, minute of a SIAC meeting on the 24th of October, and we can see in attendance Dr. Metters. And then if we turn, please, to page 8. In fact, we'd better start at page 7. This is the beginning of the item on the, in the minutes. Safety of human blood and blood product, product, product. And we see the chairman welcoming uh, Dr. Metters of the Department of Health, and he explains who he is. And then if we go over the page, please, <clears throat> um, we see at 19, uh, one sentence in, the preliminary view of the Biotechnology Working Group a subcommittee of CPMP is that it would not be possible to justify use of any blood or blood product derived from a donor with NVCJD and would advise recall or quarantining of the material. This implied that if a donor developed NVCJD, blood donated by that person would have to be traced. Whole blood had only a, a five-week shelf life. Such a small window meant the chances of picking up the donor at the relevant time were small. However, blood products had a longer life and action to trace these might be possible. Um, and then um, at the paragraph 22 at the bottom, um, we can see Dr. Will uh, reporting to this um, meeting that evidence from tonsils was beginning to su suggest that NVCJD might have a different pathogenesis from classical CJD. It was possible that blood from donors with NVCJD would be infected leading to contamination of the blood supply. The problem was to how to show whether there is an increase in infectivity in NVCJD, sorry, compared to classical CJ, CJD, and whether infectivity is present in the blood. And then if we go over the page, please, to page 10, at the bottom of page 10, we can see at paragraph 29 the practicality of leukodepletion being discussed and Dr. Metters asked whether the committee thought that 97% leuk uh, depletion was worth doing. The committee agreed it would be. The NBA paper suggested that three to four log depletion would be achieved, but even at two logs it was worth doing. The cost was practical. The cost and practical implications would have to be taken into account by others. The timing of any we could go over the page. Action was discussed, and Dr. Metters pointed out that it would take at least a year to gear the transfusion service up to carry out leukodepletion routinely. Dealing with hepatitis and AIDS had taken considerable time, and this procedure would be far more complex. And then paragraph 30, it was agreed that any proposed measures needed to be put in context of the relative risks. Dr. Metters pointed out that 50% of people receiving blood die within 18 months. 80% of the blood donated in the UK was used to prepare blood products, which might be exported. Dr. Metters asked if the risk was such that British blood should not be used at all. And then paragraph 31, the committee agreed that any risk would have to be assessed on the basis of experimental evidence of the tissue, tissues involved, the lack of a species barrier the predictions of the epidemic. Professor Smith thought it was impossible to say when more accurate predictions could be made, but it might take five years. It was agreed that a formal risk assessment was needed, making various assumptions about an epidemic. And then if we go over the page to page 12, we see uh, that the committee concluding that MVCJD was a different strain of TSC agent from sporadic CJD. The pathogenesis of NVCJD appears significantly different, and evidence was emerging, emerging that indicated that the agent may be present in tonsils and spleen. 
Other research indicated that most likely cell type to be involved was the B lymphocyte. Given that the B lymphocytes were circulating cells, it was sensible to advocate a policy of reducing exposure as far as possible by leukodepletion. The detail would be left to the National Blood Authority to work out. It was impossible to precisely predict the risk since the magnitude would depend on the number of cases of NVCJD which might arise or the number of people incubating the disease. Therefore, the committee re recommended that a risk assessment be carried out in parallel, which takes account of various levels of disease in the future. Uh, and then we see, so that uh, is a SEAC meeting in 24th of October 97. We see on the 6th of, of November 97, the Secretary of State for Health, then Frank Dobson, announcing that he had accepted the SEAC advice to extend leukodepletion to blood and blood products as a precautionary measure to protect the public from any risk of contracting VCJD. And so you heard oral evidence from Professor Collinge about his role in that, um, in that event. That's the 6th of November. On the 10th of November, the Department of Health gave instructions to the National Blood Authority to draw up a leukodepletion strategy in light of the SEAC advice. Uh, and on the 20th of November, in a press release, the CPMP announced its view that it would be prudent as a precautionary measure with respect to VCJD to withdraw batches of plasma derived medicinal products from the market in the event that a plasma pool, sorry, in the event that a donor to a plasma pool subsequently had confirmed diagnosis of VCJD. Can we next go to a press release from the 27th of November 1997? which is HSOC 0015139. This is a, um, a press release from the UK HCDO called New Variant CJD in the Treatment of Haemophilia. Could we go to page uh, two of this, please? Uh, it says at the beginning of that, there is concern about the possibility that blood and blood products might transmit the agent responsible for new variant CJD. If we could go over to page two, please. Three. Sorry, page three, thank you. Um, in nine, if we go to the first full paragraph there, in 1996, UKHCDO recommended that recombinant factor eight, or R8, concentrate was the treatment of choice for those with haemophilia A. Further, a new uncertainties about the safety of plasma products with respect to NVCJD requires that these recommendations are implemented with greater urgency. Then missing out the next sentence, the executive committee therefore recommends that patients should be treated as soon as possible with recombinant um, factor eight, manufactured without the use of bov bovine proteins or human albumin. Meanwhile, we continue to recommend strongly the use of the current licensed R um, factor eight concentrates for all people with haemophilia A. When recombinant factor nine concentrate becomes licensed, this will be the treatment of choice for those with haemophilia B. Consideration should be given to the use of recombinant uh, seven A concentrate for patients with congenital factor seven deficiency, although it is not licensed for this purpose. And then it goes on to say, Patients for whom recombinant concentrates are not available will need treatment with plasma-derived products. The choice lies between concentrates manufactured from plasma collected in countries with cases of NVCJD and BSE, or in those geographical regions in which there are currently no recorded case cases of either of these conditions. From our current understanding of the epidemiology that NVCJD occurs almost exclusively in the UK, it's likely that any risk of transmission would be reduced by using concentrates prepared from donor plasma collected in other countries, e.g. USA, where there is no recorded case, cases of NVCJD or BSE. Um, can we then turn to um, NHBT 
001722. Um, and we need to turn, please, to NHBT 000, sorry, 1722. Um, and we need to turn to, please, page 41 of that document. So this is an annex to um, the report that I mentioned earlier, authored by, um, uh, uh, co-authored by Dr. Snape. Uh, by, uh, yes, but uh, by Terry, um, yes, is that correct? Yes, it is. Um, and this is an annex, but it is, the, it is the position statement on notification of recipients adopted in December 1997 uh, by BPL and NBA. And it's, par it's paragraph three of this uh, uh, that I want to draw your attention to. Yes, just to confirm, this is from the report of Dr. Susan Shepherd and Dr. Terry Snape. It's paragraph three, position. In the event that post-donation advice indicates that an individual subsequently identified as suffering from NVCJD has contributed to a plasma pool, derived products should be withdrawn in accordance with current BPL procedures and in consultation with MCA. No attempt should be made to advise individual recipients that they have been treated with products from an affected batch. This position and its basis should be explained to consignees as part of the withdrawal action. Consignees seeking advice on patient follow-up should, should be reminded that a confidential permanent record of any human recipients, date of transfusion event, product and batch number of material transfused needs to be kept for future reference. For any patient transfused, treated with blood, blood components or plasma products, um, record in the patient's medical record the product, date given, unit, batch number. Basis for the position. The Lothian Ethics Committee, which reviewed the ethical basis of decision making in respect of the follow up study being undertaken by the National CJD Surveillance Unit, determined that no attempt should be made to trace recipients or to tell them they had received CJD implicated donations. The Ethics Committee was subsequently asked to advise on policy in respect of recipients of fractionated products from pooled plasma containing an NVCJD donor and reiterated its earlier advice. It is possible that the very act of advising a recipient in these circumstances would itself be construed as an injury, given the mental suffering that would undoubtedly result and given the probable impact on the recipient's status with respect to life healthcare insurance. Corollary. It follows from the above that there is no basis for assuming that individuals in receipt of therapeutic material from an implicated batch of plasma product should be considered to be in an at-risk category with respect to blood donation, provided in all other respects they meet our current donor selection criteria. <clears throat> uh, so now so the, the position is, is reached, if this is right. Just could we have that back, please? Uh, but where we were. That's it, thank you. Um, it, it follows that the recommendation or the, what, the, what was, this document is saying is if we know that someone has donated to a pool who subsequently uh, has uh, developed CJD, uh, then VCJD, uh, then the, the, uh, the pool should be withdrawn. That presumably is on the basis that to go on uh, uh, using the, the pool, products derived from the pool, puts people at risk. But the people who actually get uh, uh, something from the pool are not thought to be at risk. It's a rather odd position. Yes. 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 I see. Um, the, 
then uh, at the end, also at the end of 1997, we have some documentation which um, uh, shows haemophilia centres providing information to their patients about VCJD arising from the withdrawal by BPL of some of their products. And you will recall, sir, we looked at those documents that arose in, in October 1997. Um, now, some of the uh, material from haemophilia centres to their patients was of a general nature, uh, and some of it was um, of a specific nature. And I just want to look at one of those documents. It's NHBT uh, 30s 4053-004. So this is a... Uh, letter from the 2nd of December 1997 from the Royal Free Hospital, co-signed by Professor Lee, Dr. Passy and Dr. Perry to a patient. And it says, it is our practice to keep you informed of issues that relate to haemophilia care. You may have heard or read about CJD and the concerns that the agent causing this may be transmitted by blood transfusion and blood products. And then um, a next paragraph down. Uh, and it goes on to say there's no, at the present time there's no evidence for this. Um, next paragraph, Diane. As a consequence of these concerns and as a precautionary measure, there have been two recent recalls of BPL factor eight batches because it was found that a donor had not met the current health requirements for CJD. And then according to our records, you received some of the re replenate batch and then the batch numbers FHE4548 in the past. So here we have, uh, an example of patients being told that they have, in fact, received implicated batches. Uh, and then um, uh, we see on the 6th of February 1998, National Blood Authority executive letter to NHS medical directors on, on, on uh, VCJD. Can we have that up, please? It's BART 302418. It's to NHS Medical Trust Directors, um, and uh, it says PLO CO 98, dear colleague, and it sets out the background that in September 97, the Chief Medical Officer announced that the use made of blood donated by per persons who had subsequently developed um, VCJD should be traced, um, and as a purely precautionary measure, any unused blood components or products withdrawn and then there have been a number of recalls. A number of clinicians and trusts affected by these recall exercises have contacted the Department of Health to ask for the department's view on what patients who have received NVCJD implicated blood components or products should be told. This raises some very difficult issues on which the department has taken expert ethical advice. I thought it might be helpful to set out that advice. The advice which the department has received from ethics experts and other advisory bodies is that there is no need to inform patients because it is thought unlikely that NVCJD will be transmitted in this way. There is no diagnostic test for NVCJD. Even if a test was available, there is no preventative treatment that could be offered. In these circumstances, the general view is that patients will not benefit from this knowledge and that uncertainty created by informing patients could have the contrary effect, causing unjustified worry and creating a permanent blight on their lives in relation, for example, to obtaining life or health care insurance. Let me just go over the page. Um, the local ethics committee that advises the CJD surveillance unit reached the same view when considering whether to inform patients included in the epidemiological study. In deciding whether or not to inform a particular patient, the benefit-harm balance for their individual situation must be carefully considered in communicating with patients who have received implicated products, it's therefore the individual clinicians to decide whether to follow this general ethical advice. Uh, and then it, it, it says there may be some circumstances where clinicians will decide to inform a particular patient uh, of the reasons for product with withdrawal. Um, for example, where a product involved in the recall is one that's held at a patient's home. Um, and in such circumstances, uh, it is for the clinician to decide 
how best to respond, having taken careful consideration all aspect of his or her patient's circumstances. So that's the advice uh, being promulgated to um, cl clinicians um, on the ground. So I'm conscious we've been going for almost an hour. I, I'm probably about halfway through um, my uh, uh, presentation. Um, I wonder if we should take a break, a short, a shortish break now, um, or, or keep going for a bit longer. Well, I think we'll we'll, we'll um, go on. Would ten minutes or so be uh, yeah be appropriate? Then we'll take a break. Um, on the 23rd of February 1998, Frank Dobson, Secretary of Health, announced that the uh, Committee on the Safety of Medicines would review the use of UK source plasma. They would be looking at all products individually to ensure a safe and sufficient supply of blood products. Blood product recalls would be extended to include donors subsequently identified as being strongly suspected of having VCJD. Recombinant factor VIII must be made available for children under the age of 16 not yet receiving it and to new patients. And BPL would be able to import plasma so that blood products might, might now be manufactured from imported uh, plasma. And that uh, um, announcement was promulgated to the directors of public health uh, by Dr. Metters, the D Deputy Chief Medical Officer, on the same day. Um, on the 23rd of April, um, the uh, Scottish Office for the Department of Health wrote a letter to NHS Trust Medical Directors entitled um, New Variant CJD, Patients Who Have Received Implicated Blood Products and that, that referred to the UK policy of withdrawing any unused blood components or products from blood donated by those who had developed VCJD as a precautionary measure. And um, information is given about the risk in, uh, in that uh, letter. On the 13th of May, 1998, um, the... Um, Committee on the Safety of Medicines, um, having reviewed each individual blood product license, um, advised that all products should be manufactured from plasma sourced from abroad, and the Secretary of State accepted that advice. On the 15th of June 1998, SIAC recommended that the government should extend the use of leukodepletion for all blood destined for transfusion as soon as practically possible. Care should be taken that this did not impact adversely on the donation and supply of blood. On the 18th of February 1999, uh, the uh, Department of Health and SIAC received the final report from the DNV, the, the Blood Risk Assessment, as uh, described by Professor Ironside, entitled Assessment of the Risk of Exposure to VCJD Infectivity in Blood and Blood Products. And the recommendations in that, in that report included discontinuing the use of UK plasma for fractionation, and uh, establishing leukodepletion. On the 13th of August 1999, a health circular uh, was um, issued. If we can turn that up, please. It's NHBT uh, 000 
1719. It's a health circular to all, um, for action by health authorities, chief, chief executives, NHS trust, and chief executives. Um, and then if we turn, please, to page four. Um, this circular describes the present state of knowledge of the risk of transmission of VCJD from one patient to another, and it details the action that health organisations and clinicians should already be taking to reduce the risk of transmission and recommends some further precautionary measures. And then it sets out the, re the, the existing safeguards. If we go down... Um, reinforcing existing safeguards, all cases where CJD of any type is a possible diagnosis should be reported to the Research and Surveillance Unit. Effective and thorough cleansing of surgical instruments should take place um, uh, and, um, the gu and guidance already issued by the ACDP and SEAC on safe working and prevention of infection should be followed. And then the new advice, we go down, is single-use kits should always be used for lumbar punctures, uh, where practical options for using single-use instruments are available which do not compromise clinical outcome. Consideration should be used to giving those for surgical procedures. Um, and um, a little more detail is given in the in the in the in the document about um, notifying new cases to the uh, research and surveillance unit. On the sixth of October, um, the MSBT advised the Department of Health that blood from individuals who had themselves received blood from donors who had developed VCJD should not be allowed to enter the bloodstream. Uh, and that advice was accepted by the Department of Health and the um, National Blood Authority was instructed uh, accordingly. On the 1st of November 1999, all blood and blood components in the UK Blood Transfusion Service um, were subject to leukodepletion. Or they were subject to leukodepletion from this date, from the 1st of November. And then on the 20th of December 1999, Professor Doyle wrote to Dr. Hewitt expressing his view about the ethics of notifying patients who are at risk of VCJD. And this is where we see for the first time the contrary position being put, that it is ethical to inform patients about what has happened to them. Uh, and we've looked at that letter on a number of occasions, or certainly in, in um, Professor Hewitt's, um, um, Dr. Hewitt's evidence. He took the view that it would be illegal and immoral to allow someone to give blood and then simply destroy it. So, in other words, you had to tell them if you weren't going to, if you were going to take their blood and destroy it. Recipients or donors who were told that their blood could be used. Um, must be in, could, could not uh, recipients or donors who were told that their blood could not be used must be informed why, uh, and it would be wrong to deny individuals at risk of VCJD knowledge of their status. On the 12th of January 2000, um, uh, there, a letter was sent from the senior medical officer at the Department of Health, Dr. McGovern to Dr. Robinson regarding the management of potential donors known to have received blood from a person who has developed VCJD. And the letter considers the National Blood Authority's policy of flagging potential donors on, databa on databases, um, who, those donors who had been identified as having received blood from a person who had subsequently developed VCJD. Uh, and it was agreed that that information about the flagged person should be shared amongst the four nations uh, as they could present, uh, as, as that person could present as a donor anywhere in the country. Um, 
uh, and it was agreed that in the spirit of openness that the blood services would need to consider telling or offering to tell that potential donor why their blood could not be accepted. In other words, following the advice of Professor Doyle. Uh, and the health department should be contacted in the first instance uh, and it would be discussed and managed on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, and uh, the National Blood Authority agreed to develop a protocol for dealing with those cases on that basis. On the 30th of January 2000, the Midlothian uh, uh, Research Ethics Subcommittee refused the Edinburgh Research and Surveillance Unit's application for renewed ethical approval of the TMER in light of the difference of opinion as to whether or not to notify those who had either donated uh, to someone who had subsequently developed VCJD or someone who had received blood or blood products from a person who had subsequently developed VCJD. Uh, and um, Professor Will, on the 23rd of May 2000, made a further application to the Ethics Committee to reconsider ethical approval. So there was a period between January 2000 uh, uh, to reconsider ethical, uh, and, May to, uh, and May 2000. Um, uh, so in May 2000, he made an application to reconsider ethical approval for the TMER on the basis that it was unethical not to do the study because it might be the only mechanism by which transmission of VCJD through blood or blood products could be identified. Um, and an expert group had been set up to consider each incident as it occurred. So my understanding is that there was a period where there was not ethical approval for the TMER because of this... Um, conflicting evidence, conflicting advice, sorry, about whether or not the patient should be told. Um, and um, on the 30th of May, the um, Midlothian Research Ethics Subcommittee reinstated clinical approval for the TMER on the basis of, uh, that the decision as to whether to inform a person identified um, as being at risk by the TMR TMER was left to the local health authority. So in other words, it came out of the TMR. It wasn't a decision for the TMER for which the um, ethical approval. So, so it, they weren't giving ethical approval for that decision. That was a decision that was to be taken by another body. Um, on the 1st of April 2000, um, the uh, 1st of April 2000 is, is the date by which only leukodepleted blood products were transfused to patients within the NHS. So you will recall that all blood and blood components have been leukodepleted by the 1st of November 1999. But in terms of the date from which leukodepleted uh, products were transfused to patients, that date is the later date of the 1st of April 2000. Um, on the 26th of October 2000, the BSE inquiry report was published. And on the 26th of October 2000, that same date, the government announced it would set up a fund for the care of victims of uh, uh, VCJD. Just give me one, one moment, if you would. Um. On the 1st of November uh, 1999, you told me that all blood and blood components in the UK blood transfusion service had been subject to leukodepletion and was since that date. Um, 1st of April 2000, only leukodepleted blood products transfused to patients within the NHS after 1st of April 2000. Um, so the difference is that this, on the 1st of April 2000, is dealing with blood products, whereas that on the 1st of November is dealing with blood and blood components. Um, I think that might be right. Let me... Um, because otherwise, the, the two are, are at odds, aren't they? Yes, although uh, um, perhaps frozen components... Let me find the reference to... 
uh, that document. Um, um, I mean, the, the casual reader might otherwise think that after the first reserve in 1999, there was effective leukodepletion across the piece, and it wouldn't be the case. Yes. I th that, 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 um, sorry, sir. Uh, for some reason, I, I can't put my um, finger on the, um, the document. Perhaps during the break, I can uh, find um, where it is in my file. Uh, um, here we go. I've got it. Um, it's... Uh, well, perhaps, uh, perhaps, sir, can I come back to you on the... Um, on that, that, that point after the break. Well, perhaps that would be a, a, a useful point then in which yes, to break, you. wouldn't it? Thank you. So, shall we take a, a break uh, now uh, and uh, come, come back at, at, uh, at four o'clock? Uh, yes, five, um, four o'clock. <laughs>